Today's episode is brought to you by Diamondback Tool Belts. Make it a Diamondback, make it yours. This tool belt system is the premier tool belt system across the globe. You can find this thing wherever you go on the best contractors that you've ever met. Diamondback Tool Belts is an amazing tool belt system that is customizable to your specific needs, as well as you can buy some already set up designs that are for your specific trade, be it an electrician, a solar panel installer, a, a general contractor, a finished carpenter, um, a, a woodworker. No matter what it is, you can find a setup for you. As a matter of fact, I have my own signature Diamondback Tool Belt called the Dawson, and this is something that I personally designed myself with the designers at Diamondback to create something that specifically fit my needs. The shocker, ladies and gentlemen, is that it happens that my specific needs met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people's specific needs, and my tool belt has become one of the best-selling tool belts of all time. It's called the Dawson. It is an amazing tool belt, positive reviews all across the board. If you guys are in the trades and you want to find a tool belt that will not rip apart on you, break down, and you want customer service to back you up, go to Diamondback Tool Belts. You can check it out. You can hit the link in my bio, which is thejohndawson.com. Click on the Diamondback Tool Belt logo, and it'll take you straight to that page. Oops, almost knocked my iPad over. And you guys can check out Diamondback Tool Belts. Get it for a loved one who's blue collar. Get it for a buddy. Get it for yourself. Or just get one to hang up on the wall because they look that damn good. Diamondback Tool Belts, the John Dawson. That's John spelled J-O-N.com, and you can find that there. What is up, guys? I hope you're doing amazing. I hope you're having a a uh, a good start to your to your new year. Um, I hope things are uh, up, starting off better than this podcast is. Uh, well, um, this is the John Dawson perspective. Welcome back. I appreciate you guys stopping by. Um, we're getting back into it this new year. Uh, if you guys don't know, uh, the John Dawson Perspective was a top-rated podcast throughout 2020, 2021, and the beginning of 22. But then um, during 22, I kind of got busy building a house, um, turning some raw land into something special. As a matter of fact, I'm sitting on that land as we speak right now. Uh, this is actually the second house on the property. You guys saw the house that I built up top. You don't know that, but this is on the bottom of the property. The house that I built is on the other, on the top of the property. Uh, this is just a little tiny home, an in-law suite, a, a guest house, a podcast studio, an office, uh, 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 you know, a, a whatever it needs to be when the time comes house. And um, I'm very grateful and blessed for, for where I'm at today. Um, but I figured it was time to to hop back into the podcast. You know what I mean? Get people have been asking, John, when you getting back in the podcast, man? When you going to do it? Uh no better time than now, you know what I mean? So, I figured one uh all of these podcasts will be on YouTube. I'll be watching some video clips on here. So, if you want to see the full effect, you can watch it on YouTube, but audio is going to be just as good. You'll be able to hear everything that's going on. We're going to have a fun time. We're going to have some guests come in here. Uh, you know, this is just going to be a, be a casual podcast. I'm not going to take it too crazy. Um, I'm not going to do nothing super, super wild with it. You know what I mean? I'm just going to kind of, uh, have fun with it. Talk about some stuff. You guys know, I, I have a hard time keeping my mouth shut when I see stuff, when I see things, I say things. Um, and I don't mean any of it in a negative way, but just in the sense of like, you know, I'm blessed to be in a part of my life where I don't have to worry about the man getting me if I say something, you know what I mean? I, you know, I see a lot of people out there and they out there grinding, they out there doing what they've got to do to get what they got to get. And I appreciate that. And I respect that. But I also feel like I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a specific place where I actually have been kind of blessed with being able to be wild, be, be fun, be funny. I'm really funny. I'm not really a funny guy, but you know, um, if you have the ability to speak up, then speak up. So we're just going to have conversations. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to talk about things going on. We're going to talk about things that I got going on. If you guys don't know, I finally finished for the most part, my main house that I've been building for the last year or so. 
Um, just a little three bedroom, two bathroom. You guys have seen the whole YouTube situation. Um, that's pretty much done except for some little things here and there. Uh, but it's pretty much done for the most part. Um, you know, when you're, when you're a contractor, nothing's ever done. You know what I mean? I, I built a whole deck and then, and then six months later I tore the whole deck out and put in a new deck cause I didn't like the old one. Um, why? Because I can. Um, and that's not a brag. Uh, I wish I did it right the first time, <laughs> But uh, you never you never know what you see when you're looking around. You're like, man, I don't like the way that sits. I don't like the way that looks. That color ain't right. So you change it. So people always ask me, John, you done with your house? No, I'll never be done with my house. Um, plus, there's one more house that I still have to build on this property. Uh, there's a barn I still got to build on this property. There's a shop I still got to build on this property. There's a lot, a lot to come. But um, I'm building the dream. You know what I mean? That wasn't supposed to rhyme. Um, I'm building the dream. You know, when you, uh, when you, uh, step outside of the matrix and I say that because I don't have a better word for it, but I don't like that word, but it's, I don't have a better word for it. When you step outside the matrix and you realize the chase for whatever it is you're chasing is fake, um, and doesn't actually serve what you love you start to you start to look at alternative options. Um, I tell people this all the time. I'd rather be poor on my terms than rich on yours. And and what I mean by that is I'd rather be struggling and fighting the fight for what I truly love and what makes me happy and brings me joy than to be fighting your fight because you pay me enough money to put away and put aside what makes me happy and what brings me joy, you know? And I did that for a while, right? I had my construction company and I constantly had to answer to clients. Clients were never happy. Um, I mean, they were happy, but you know, they're never fully happy. Anybody in, in, in construction or service based anything knows that you could bend over backwards. You can give some extras, you can give some discounts, you can go the extra mile, you can add something that you think the client's going to be so thankful for. And no matter what you do, the, the, the next question out of them is how much is it going to cost me and how do I pay this man less? Um, not everybody, but a lot of people. And I was like, I'm tired of running around trying to do right by everyone else while everyone else is trying to do right by themselves. Does that make sense? You know, imagine you imagine you go and you build a house for somebody and you're like, you know, they give you this sob story, which I'm not saying is not true, but they're like, oh, you know, money's tight, this and there and that and the other. Um, and and you being a person whose money's tight and you understand what it's like to have have, you know, a tight situation. So you're like, man, they're paying a lot of money. I want to do the best I can for these people. I want to make sure that they end up in a better place tomorrow than they were today. So you do all these things to try to benefit these people because they told you their story and they got this. I mean, think about it. You do it every time when you go to buy something, you buy a car. Oh, I can't do this. You go buy a house. Oh, I can't. You try to get the price down because that's what we as humans do. But when you stop and think about the person on the other side, and I'm not saying everyone's like this, but you think about the guy who installs your floor. You think about the guy who paints your house or the guy who framed your house, or the guy who whatever, he's probably struggling and figuring it out too. He's probably got bills. He's got kids. He's got school. He's got to pay for. He's got college funds he's trying to contribute to. He's got savings. He's got, you know, a vacation fund. Like he's trying to live his life too by allocating money in the right spots. And he's out there grinding every single day. And then you want to come in and say that your money and where your money needs to be and how much money you need to put to your vacation fund is more important than his. So, me as someone who has a lot of empathy for others due to coming from fairly nothing, um, I always found myself just trying to help other people because I know what it's like um, to be helped and I know what it's like to need help. Um, and after a while, I was like, man, I'm helping these people. And in the end, it always comes down to how do they get more at the very end. You're closing out all your tabs, you're closing out all your invoices, and all they're doing is trying to figure out how to how to squeeze a few more pennies out of you or how to tell you that something didn't look the way they thought it would look, even though you told them it wouldn't look good. And now they're trying to make you pay for it because they made the wrong decision and forced you to do something that you didn't really want to get behind in the first place. That's why I stopped doing construction for people. You know, I was kind of like, at what point do I prioritize my joy, uh, my family, 
what I want to do over everyone else. And I feel like in today's society, we have a lot of people that think uh, it's cool to hate yourself and do everything for others, right? Our culture is like this self-loathing, like, oh, I hate myself because I'm white and I'm privileged, which means, you know, I need to be upset about my success or I hate myself because, you know, I'm, you know, uh, whatever it is. And you, you try to like ease your internalized hatred by doing more for other people. Um, or, you know, this whole the whole like virtue signaling that we have going on nowadays where these wars pop up and we got to take a side on, on which side of the war we're on. Um, before we ever just take a side of, of America or our family or our community, our neighborhoods, our, our county, right? More people nowadays, it seems, uh, would rather send money to Ukraine than, than, than buy a homeless man a sandwich that's in their own neighborhood. More people would rather go online and virtue signal about Israel and Palestine than, than go down to the Boys and Girls Club who have underprivileged lifestyles who don't have the parents or the parents are gone or working all the time. They would rather go virtue signal for Palestine or for Israel or for uh, Ukraine than go help some kids that are, that, are, that are without something. You know what I mean? At some point, we got to start taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of other people. You can't just throw your health and your mental well-being and your livelihood and your family under the bus to go out there and 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 do things for everyone else all the time. So in 2020, uh, I kind of got a glimpse of what the world's about. Um, I was at the height of my construction company. I talked about BLM and how I wasn't a fan of it. Um, I called it out um, pretty hardcore, just being like... Um, this isn't going to help anybody that needs help. BLM isn't going to help the kid playing on the street corner who, who, whose dad's gone and mom has to work four jobs. BLM's not going to help that black kid. BLM's not going to help the kid in high school who's struggling on his grades and is about to drop out and become, you know, whatever. Um, and he needs a little bit of encouragement, someone to believe in him, someone to empower him, someone to, you know, help him uh, realize that college is a possibility or help him to realize that getting into the trades or starting this company or getting into this, you know, industry is possible. Um, BLM's not going to help that young black kid with that. And that's when it all kind of clicked for me. And I'm like, all this virtue signaling, this, this, you know, um, we need to eradicate homelessness. We need to feed hungry children. Yet you send a billion dollars to homelessness and only a hundred thousand makes it there. Where did the rest of the money go? Well, it went into the pockets of the people who, who pushed the bill through, who, who had an idea, who signed a signature somewhere saying, Hey, you know, I helped you get elected. So whenever you pass a bill, I need a couple bills coming back to me, a couple, couple dollars, couple, couple dollar bills coming back, back into my pocket, into my wallet. Cause I, cause I believed in you with my dollars and now I need you to pay me back for those dollars. Right. And when I started looking at all that, I was like, you know what? I need to stop building a life for everyone else and start building it for myself, which is when we went out and bought this, the, the acreage that we bought and started building a house. And, and we didn't, we didn't bring anybody in. I didn't bring anybody in. I built the house myself, you know, from, 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 from the, the scraping of the ground, from the cutting of the trees, to the digging of the holes, to the pouring of the concrete, to the setting the rebar, to the framing the floor, framing the, framing the walls, installing the flooring, framing the roof, like all of that stuff I did myself because I wanted to create something that I owned. I didn't want to owe a mortgage company something because um, they're not going to look out for me when things get tough. I didn't want to owe a, a builder something because he's not going to look out for me when things get tough. Um, I didn't want to owe, you know, the government or, 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 or the city or anybody something because in the end, when I hit hard times and, and someone in my family passes away or I break my arm and I can't this and I can't that, none of them are going to care, right? Because we don't actually care. We pretend that we care. We don't actually care. Because when we see people in our own neighborhood struggling, rather than do that, we put a, a Ukraine flag on our flagpole and we let the family next door get foreclosed on. You know what I mean? And that's, and that's kind of why I was like, I need to get in a position I need to get myself into a position where I can not only be self-sustainable, but be in a position where I'm so set and I have so little overhead that if other people do need help, I can then reach out and help other people without harming myself and my family. And I think that's something that we need to get back to here in the United States is being like, 
I don't need to send my money off to BLM or Ukraine or Palestine or Israel or some, you know, nonprofit that's that's put together by a billionaire um, who is, in my opinion, not showing all his cards. I, I, I just I, I, I'm not saying that they're not doing the right thing. I'm saying it's, it's really hard to track this stuff. I mean, if you don't pay your taxes, you go to prison. If the government can't tell you where they spent your taxes, they get a budget increase. How is this? How have we gotten here? Pentagon can't account for over 60% of its spending. You miss your taxes by 20%. You're going to prison. You know what I mean? So I, I've been trying to figure out how do I, how do I build this? And, and so far, I think I've been doing a pretty good job. You know, we, we, we have some things and some stuff. It's nothing's flashy. The cars are paid off, right? I don't owe, I don't owe, you know, any of that. I don't have credit cards, which makes life very difficult. Um, I don't have credit cards. It makes life very difficult, but I also don't, I can't buy things I can't afford. I, I build at the speed of cash, right? Um, if, if I can't cash it, if I can't pay for it, I don't do it. And it, it, it does stifle your growth to a certain extent. Now, if you're doing a bunch of business, by all means, leverage good debt when it's an asset, not when it's a liability, a home is a liability, right? Where you live and where you, where you, where you raise your family and where you go home to is a liability that doesn't make you money. Now I do have home offices and all that stuff, but in the end, no, it doesn't really make me that money. So how do you build your life with cash to where you aren't leveraging what you need um, at any point in time? You're, you're not going to lose the ground you live on, right? All I have to do is make sure I pay my taxes and I'm fairly set. A uh, really cool thing recently that I did. So we have chickens here, which is cool because, you know, they they produce eggs. Um, this year was the first year that I actually went hunting. Um, and I hunted my own property. And um, I got uh, two deer. And uh, actually here in this, in this tiny home down at the bottom corner of our property, my freezer is full to the brim. I actually had to put some in my freezer up in my other house with, with deer meat. We got backstrap. We got, we got ground. We got the little, the little steaks and all that other stuff. I mean, I probably won't go through that for a year. And that came from the land that I own. Um, it came from, from, you know, the, the, the deer that are on the property that I own. Um, and that's food. And, 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 you know, I'm not saying people need to go green and be super hippy dippy. You know what I mean? You ain't got to be no crazy, you know, weirdo. But I think having some things put in place to where you could kind of take care of yourself if push came to shove, you know, I think that's kind of cool. It's kind of a freeing feeling to look around the world and be like, man, a lot is going bad. I don't know where the meat's coming from. I don't know what's in the meat. I don't know what's in the, in the produce, right? What are they spraying on that stuff? Now I'm not an organic crazy. I'm not. An, I'm not someone that. I mean, if you look into organic, it's not even what it really seems to be. Um, I'm not crazy about all that stuff. You know, I eat fast food. I'm not trying to, you know, remove myself. But I do like the fact that you know, if something were to happen, you never know. Like I used to talk about this way back in the day, and nowadays it's like almost. You know, I almost feel internally, and I don't want to like sound crazy, but like internally, I feel like it's a matter of time, not like if it ever. It's more like when it happens. You know what I mean? Um. Because the world's just crazy, man. It's just, there's a lot of stuff going on that a lot of people aren't talking about, you know? The other day, the Epstein, the Epstein files, some of them got dropped, and, and, and you hear all these things about, like, Clinton's on the list. Like, we knew Clinton. We knew Bill Clinton was on the list. But, like, that's crazy that this guy's still out there, like, head of the DNC, out there, you know, giving speeches and, and teaching a class. He's got a, he's got a master class online on how to be a leader. This man's teaching people in America to this very second that I'm sitting here, how to be a leader in America. And he's on the Epstein logs over 30 times. He's mentioned in all these documents that are, that are released that he's doing what they were all doing and not a repercussion, no media outlets covering it. No one's covering it. And you're just thinking about the way the world is because it's not good and evil anymore. It's powerful and not powerful in charge and not in charge. Now, if you're in charge, you can do whatever you want. See, the thing is, if and I'm not trying to get really crazy political on you, um, and you can you can love and hate who you want. You can love Clinton, that's fine. You can hate 
Clinton, you can love Trump, you can hate Trump. But what's crazy is there's more news out there about how people think Donald Trump was going to be on the logs. There was more news about how they thought he was going to be on the logs than there was about Clinton actually being on the logs, which shows you who's in power and who's not. Trump's not in power. He's not in the popular club. He's not in the good old boys club, right? Which is like, okay, so why? I mean, sure, if he's on the logs, by all means, take this man down. But like, shouldn't we just start with the people that are on it, that we know that are on it? The Stephen Hawking, which is crazy. The Bill Clinton, which is crazy. So we live in a world where right is not right and wrong is not wrong. It's who's doing what that makes it okay or not okay. Um, and that's a scary place because you and I might do something that is totally fine, but we're on the wrong side and we're not in the good old boys club. We're going to get in trouble. You saw it with the whole January 6th thing. You saw it with the BLM thing. It's all about who are you and who do you stand behind? And if you stand behind the right people, or in this case, the wrong people, then you can do the wrong thing. But if you stand behind, in my opinion, the right people and you do the right thing, you could be construed as doing the wrong thing. It's insane, dude. We live in a world that's upside down. Um, a lot of kids out here are being taught to, to hate themselves because they were raised in privilege or they were raised, you know, in a country that wasn't nice 400 years ago. So you're supposed to hate yourself. And then we wonder why we have these mental health issues. We wonder why kids are underachieving and they're not doing good at schools. Well, because they're being taught that they were terrible. They came in here and they destroyed Native Americans. They came in here and they enslaved people and they came in here and they, they, they killed people. They raped people. And it's like, no, they didn't. Their ancestors did, but you can't you can't project your moral high ground in 2024 on what happened back, you know, in, in 1870. You know what I mean? But these kids are growing up just hating themselves because they're like, oh my gosh, I'm a bad person when they've never done anything bad in their life. And that's how you take down that's how you take down a strong, a strong uh, uh, country is just telling people that you're trash for no for for nothing that you did, but for just existing in a place, you're trash. And, and I, and I think that that's scary, which is why I'm, I'm happy. My daughters are being raised, uh, in the location that we're at. I'm happy. My daughters are being raised to believe in themselves, to be powerful, to know that they don't need validation from a person. They don't know. They don't need validation from a school system. They don't need validation from anybody but themselves, right? If you believe you did the right thing and you are trying your best to be the best person possible, that is an amazing thing to do. And I'm proud of you for it. And you should be proud of yourself for it. Um, just because it's the popular opinion doesn't mean it's the right opinion, right? There's tons of popular opinions out there. Communism has a populace behind it that you would not believe. Socialism has a population behind it that you would not believe. Conservatism, Christians, uh, atheists, there, there's popular opinions everywhere. It doesn't make them right. You need to find out what's right. You need to find out what's good, which is why I base myself off a really simple, um, you know, idea, which is do good to people until they give you a reason not to. I don't care where you come from, what you look like, what size you are, where you line up. If you're being good to people, literally not, not someone said you were good or someone said you were bad. If you are being good, I'm going to be good to you. Right. And this is the whole thing with the whole racism thing. People calling people racism, racist when they haven't done anything that's racist. I don't call really anyone. I've, I've never actually personally met a racist or necessarily seen anybody who is racist. I've seen some people that are assholes, dicks, <laughs> idiots, undereducated. But no one, I, I've never really seen someone that's like being racist. They might say something that's a little on edge and maybe came out wrong or or could be construed as, but they're like, oh, are you racist? No, I'm not racist. I don't mind people. It's like, but they still get called racist, even though they literally say I'm not racist and they explain what they said. We would love to call them racist because we want to hate people. We just want to hate people for no reason. Purely because we feel like if we can hate someone, that makes us better than them, which makes us feel good about ourselves. Rather than, hey, you know what? Did you not, you said this, what do you mean by that? Oh, you mean, that? oh, so you didn't mean it this way? No, I didn't, okay. And then you understand that that person is explaining to you what they were talking about. You know, that's that's what I'm thinking. But anyway, I got off track here. Um, I decided to build build up my ranch, um, kind of start, start, you know, doing things for me. Spending time with my family, spending time on my land, spending time building things that I'm proud of that I think will make a positive impact. This podcast is one of them. 
um, creating a positive impact, believing in people. Um, there was there was a, a kid I was talking to, a kid, he's probably 19, 20, and he was asking me about, you know, how I built what I have. And I just kind of explained to him like how simple it was. And I'm like, the idea and, and the execution is simple. Or, or no, no, the, the idea and the plan is simple. The execution is what's difficult. And I told him this and I'm like, but I believe that you can do it. Like through talking to you, you're a very smart kid. You have a good head on your shoulders. You see things that a lot of people in this world don't see. Like, I, I believe that you can do it. And he told me, he's like, I've never had someone say that I could do this. We have a massive amount of kids being raised today that have never been told that they can do something. have never been told that someone believes in them. And I think we're missing that. Our school system doesn't tell kids that we believe in them. We tell them that they should get better grades. We tell them that they should apply themselves more. We tell them that they're stupid if they can't take a test. We tell them all these different things. And then we wonder why we're spitting out these kids that don't try, that can't read, that, that have no critical thinking, that don't have any type of logical foundation to their, to their thoughts. And we're like, why is our country in such a bad? Well, because you're creating crappy people, you know, and we need to believe in people. I, I mean, there are so many people out here that come from nothing and everyone wants to call them the exception. Right. Especially in the black community, because obviously I'm black. If you're listening to this and you didn't know, (laughs) Um, people are always like, oh, John, you're the exception. I'm like, why do you see a black man that's done something successful and created something out of almost nothing? And you say that they're the exception. Like, that's one of the most disrespectful things to black people that I've ever heard say. And and the main amount of people that tell me that are black people are like, you're the exception. Everyone can't do that. I'm like, yes, everyone can do that. Not everyone will. But if people would would just believe in themselves. I'm not saying you're going to go out and make a million dollars. I'm not saying you're going to go out and buy massive amounts of acreage and and, and do all this other stuff. But if you actually believe in yourself and you slowly start chasing what you want, you'd be shocked. Like for me, I never thought I'd have this. So I grew up in California, a little backstory on me. I grew up in California. Um, I was adopted. My parents um, were just blue collar. Basically, my dad uh, owned a flooring store. He installed flooring. And um, we were raised eating peach juice on our Cheerios. (laughs) Yeah, for real though, we ate peach juice on our Cheerios because uh, my mom didn't like milk um, for some reason. I don't really remember why, uh, but I had peach juice on my Cheerios. We didn't get like the Honey Nut O's, right? We, they weren't even Cheerios. They were like, I think they were called like Circle O's or something. Like they came in like a white and blue box. Uh, it was just, I think the the generic, um, you know, store brand Cheerios. Um, and that was when we were lucky. Most of the time we were eating cornmeal mush which came in like a 50 bag, <laughs> a 50 uh, pound bag, or really eaten oatmeal, which also came in like a 25 pound, 50 pound bag. Um, my parents had adopted five kids and they had three foster kids before that. And um, they uh, had to make a little go a long way. And through that, you realize the decisions people make to be successful are way more important than just chasing success, right? Because you can chase success your entire life and never get there if you're spending money as though you're already successful, right? Like I see a lot of people out there and I'm victim, I'm not victim, I'm, I'm, uh, um, I'm guilty of this as well, where, you know, you want to look like you're doing well. So you buy the stuff that makes you look like you're doing well, because you think that's going to make you do well, you know, look good, feel good. But then you realize you're overextending yourself and you're trying to chase success while living in the success you're chasing. And then you never make it because your money is gone. You're not willing to eat the beans and rice uh, because it's not cool. You're not willing to um, buy the 2008 vehicle instead of the 2024 vehicle because people aren't going to look at you the same. You don't want to, um, you know, uh, sell your favorite Xbox or whatever else, because then you're not gonna be able to play games and people are gonna make fun of you for not, you know, knowing how to play 2k speaking from experience. (laughs) Um, and that's holding you back more than any type of, I can't find a good job. Right. And I say this, I mean, living expenses are high, but I also feel like at some point you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. For example, when I moved from California to Kansas to go to school was when I first caught a glimpse of self-sustainability in the sense of financial being possible. Cause I live in California. I live in the central coast of California, very expensive. 
Um, my dad bought a ranch there when way, way, way back, I think in 80 something. And he got it for like, I don't know, 300,000 or something like that. And, um, by the time I was actually starting to look at like, okay, I want to start a family. I want to get married. I want to have some land. I want to do all this different stuff. You know, I couldn't find anything to buy for under 400,000. And that 400,000 was a house up in a Tascadero that was, I think, what was it? 500 square feet on like a 6,000 square foot lot. And I'm like, I'm spending $400,000 to live in a cubicle. And I don't even have 4,000. Like that wasn't even an option. Like I wasn't, I didn't have the down payment for 400,000. So that was already like, I don't know, $400,000 higher than what I could afford. So I was looking around California. I'm like, dude, where am I going to, what am I going to do? I can't start a family in my parents' bedroom. Like I can't, I can't, I can't get married and like bring my wife home to my parents' house. Like I can't do that. So I was blessed to have an opportunity to go play football in Kansas. And when I was in Kansas, I started looking at real estate there and I was like, dang, I could buy a 1,780 square foot house on a 10,000 square foot lot for $32,000. And my wheels started turning. I was like, yeah, okay, wait, time out. Do I have to live in California? Right? Because I had my dream. My dream was I wanted to have land. I wanted to have animals, horses. I wanted to raise a family um, where, where they could run around on the property, kind of like how I grew up. And I couldn't do that in California. It just wasn't possible. And rather than be a prude and be like, well, I have to live in California because, you know, the ocean makes me more important. Um, the weather makes me more of a, you know, a legitimate human. Um, I was like, well, what's wrong with Kansas? What's wrong with all these other states where I can actually get a job, get a down payment, buy one of these houses, fix it? You know what I mean? So my wheels started spinning. And um, I remember talking to my dad. And when I found this, this, um, this, um, this $32,000 30, $32, house that was a foreclosure and it needed some work, but I had some skills. I was like, Hey, how do I buy this? Jobber. Jobber is a CRM, a customer relationship management software that I currently use and absolutely love. Now you can go to Jobber and get a 14 day free trial, but this company helps you with invoices, with branding, with, with customer communication. Um, you can send them text messages with their, with their invoice. You can send them reminders that you're going to come service whatever it is that you do. This is an amazing software that puts everything in one. I was the guy that had receipts spread all across my truck. I didn't know where anything was. If I lost a receipt, I had to call the store and say, hey, can you print out my receipt for X, Y, and Z so I can use it for my taxes or, or for my client invoices? Whatever it was, it was a mess. Now everything is in jobber everything so if i need to look up something it's there you can get pdf printouts you can send your invoice with your own logo on it you can you can text customers you can um, have pretty much anything you could possibly need um, i've been using it i love it i actually started out with a 14-day free trial so if you go to my website thejohndawson.com click on jobber the logo that says jobber you'll see me there with a little white cowboy hat looking all schnazzy um, click on that and you can check out jobber for 14 days for free i did that and during that 14 days i actually got a phone call like an old school phone call from Jobber saying, hey, John, we saw that your company is using Jobber. Do you have any questions, concerns, or need help with anything? And I was like, yo, now that's service. So I actually had a few questions. I asked them a few questions. They got me set up. I used the rest of my 14-day free trial as they helped me with it. And then I was like, you know what? With how much this thing can do and how helpful customer service is, I'm signing up. So I signed up for the first month just to give it another 30 days and I, I haven't looked back. I use it for literally everything. You guys know I have multiple companies and employees and my employees clock in through Jobber. I can look at the readouts for each month, each week and how many hours my employees are working, what jobs uh, um, and how many hours they're working at each job. So if you got 13 jobs in a week, you know if they spent two hours here, three hours there, one hour there, 30 minutes there, you can divide everything up so nicely um, I would highly recommend Jobber. Again, go to thejohndawson.com, click on the little Jobber logo, and check out Jobber for free for 14 days. So he talked me through it. I'm like, okay, well, you need a down payment. You're gonna need it. You're gonna need a, around. I think it was like a $6,200 down payment. And I was like, well, I got a FAFSA check coming in, and I don't need to buy. I don't need to buy anything else. My rent is 900 bucks a month, which we couldn't afford. I had to move out anyway. I was like, I think I had three or four months left on my lease in my apartment. And I was like, I need to move out because I'm spending $12,000 a month or $12,000 a year just to rent something that I don't own. If I put that $12,000 a year into a house, that's equity. 
So I started running these numbers and I'm like, yo, let's buy this foreclosure. Let's fix this thing up, right? Put our time and our, and our, and our sweat into this because every drop of sweat is going to be a dollar back to me that when I sell this house, I'm going to actually make that versus renting. So long story short, you guys probably heard this, but um, bought the house and um, worked on it nonstop. So I was playing football and I was going to school at Ottawa University in Ottawa, Kansas. And um, I bought this 3,200 square, or thir- I bought this $32,000 house. We put 6,200 bucks down. And then um, we looked at all the money that we could pull together to remodel this thing. And um, I had construction skills. So basically I ran the budget. I'm like, if I can, over the course of my next two years here, if I can come up with $20,000, which is a lot of money, but over time, you can kind of figure it out. So I had people that I reached out to said, Hey, here's the house. I already bought the house. Here's, um, here's the, uh, cost it's going to take me to get it up to par. And here's how much I can sell it for, get the money. And before, um, we moved into it, I had to fix it. So we had, I had three months during, during sports. So I had 4am practices, 4am weight room. Well, it depended on some, Every other day I was on the field, every other day I was in the, in the, in the gym, 4 a.m. And then my first class wasn't until 10.30 a.m. So I would get up at around 3.45 in the morning to drive, because I lived about 30 minutes away from campus, drive to campus, and I practiced from, I think it was 4.30 to 6. And then I would just literally, because I didn't, I didn't have to shower, I was going to go get dirty anyway, I would put my work clothes on, I would drive to the house, which was about three blocks from the campus, I would drive to the house. And I would work from probably around 6.15 to 10. And then I would try and clean up, take a hooker bath, you know what I mean? Like go, go, to, go to campus, go into the locker room and, and just rinse myself off as quick as possible. And then I'll go to class from 10 to around, I think I was in class till around 3.30. And then after 3.30, I had practice. I think practice was at 4.15 or we had to start getting ready at 4.15. Got ready for practice at 4.15. We practiced and we were practicing till around 6-ish. Um, and then I'll go back to the house and I'd work till probably around 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I did this for three months straight. For those who don't know, at this point in time, um, my wife was pregnant with our first child and there were no other options. Let's put it that way, which I, which was amazing. There were no other options, which was probably the best case for me because it kept me going. So, um, we had a baby due in June. And so basically I had those three, well, technically it was four months to the, to the due date, um, to turn a foreclosure into a livable space for a baby. Um, and those were probably some of the most exhausting, uh, times in my entire life. But, you know, going there. Every day after morning practice and every day after evening practice um, and any time I had during the day, uh, during the weekends, I was working on that house. I mean, it was it was it was a gut job. Um, there was walls that were taken out. There was drywall that was taken down. It was all that slat and plaster. I had to knock all that out. Um, it was it was tough. It was it, there, were, you know, it was tough, um, but I got it done. Uh, the downstairs. So there's an upstairs and the downstairs. So I focused on the downstairs. I got the downstairs done just in time. Um, I think we were in the house for about a week before the baby was born. Um, and uh, lived in that house for the rest of my time in Kansas. Now, when, when we moved back to California from Kansas, um, I rented the house out for, I think it was 1300 bucks a month. Um, it was finished by then. And, uh, that rented out for about six months while we were in California and I hated California. I was back in California. I was looking at home prices. I was looking at, you know, taxes. I was looking at jobs. Um, I was also waiting for the NFL to call me, right. Which is a horrible thing to do is just sit around and wait for somebody to bet on you and then potentially lose everything. So I was doing, I did the pro day, I did the combine. Um, and then I was sitting around waiting for these phone calls and I got some phone calls and I was going here and I was doing trials here. And, it hit me while I was in California for those six months that um, if I get accepted to a mini camp for a team, Canadian league, NFL, whatever it is, um, I still have to make the team. 
So let's say all the stars align and my and my washed up self gets picked up on a team. Then if I sprain my ankle or someone beats me out, it's over, right? So I was like, this is this is scary. And then the practice squad salary at that time, I'm trying to think of what it was. I can't really remember. I want to say it was like $143,000 to, to get signed on to a practice squad. $143,000 a year, I'm pretty sure. And that's if you stick with it, that you stay on it, blah, 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 all this stuff. All these stars have to align. Your health has to align. Your performance has to align. Everything has to align. And I was like, that's not even enough money for me to buy a house in California. So even if all of these stars align and the dream happens, I still can't live in a, I still can't buy a home in California. I still can't live where my parents live. You know what I mean? Like it's, I it can't, it's, it still doesn't work. And that's if everything goes perfect to plan and continues to go perfect to plan. So that was when I was like, you know what? I'm going to flip houses. So, um, I actually drove back to Kansas, um, by myself and the tenants moved out and I remodeled, um, the house, not, not remodeled, but I touched up all the stuff that had been damaged, you know, some paint, um, some flooring, some plumbing stuff. I got it all ready to sell. Um, and eventually actually sold it to a bank, um, or not, it wasn't a bank. It was like a, uh, investment bank. Um, and, and walked away with about $83,000 from that house. So with that $83,000, um, I, uh, invested in something, um, that was supposed to be amazing and, uh, turned out not to be so much. Wasn't what I had planned it at all. So that, uh, went away pretty quick. And then I was like, okay, well that's that shot. There goes that. But the cool thing about failure like that, which in the moment was one of the most humbling, embarrassing, worst times of my life. Um, I said, if I did it once, I can do it again, right? So uh, sitting in California, um, I was like, okay, what are my options here? What am I going to do? So I started downloading every real estate investing book, watching YouTube, figuring out how to get money. You know, I had no money. I had 170 something bucks, right? Like it was, it was literally nothing. I was driving my, um, I think I was driving my dad's truck at that time, Um but um, I had I had pretty much nothing, so I was like, I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. So um, we sat down and just started looking at a map. I'm like, what, where, where, what's the cost of living in these places? What's the taxes? Um, what's the the you know the 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 uh, level of entry to these places? Like like what does it cost to get something started? Uh, we're looking at Tennessee. We're looking at Texas. Uh, North Carolina, um, kind of looked at Kansas, but I knew I didn't want to live in Kansas cause I'd been there for two years and that snow is cold. Uh, so eventually we landed on Texas. Um, and to move to Texas, uh, I had to figure out how to get there. So I had no money. Um, I was waiting for an investment to come in, uh, that to this day has not come in. Um, and we're like 10 years down the road by now. Um, and that investment was told to me that it would come in. Uh, I was told, Hey, next week it's going to come in next month. This was going to come in. And I remember we, we headed to Texas around Thanksgiving. Um, Pearson ranch jerky. This is an amazing jerky and beef stick company. They have all types of flavors. They have elk jerky. They have venison. They have Buffalo. They have wild boar. I mean, talk about some manly beef sticks. Check out Pearson Ranch Jerky. Um, I actually have a beef bucket. A, 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 what is it called? A, a beef bucket? A, 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 a meat bucket. It's called a meat bucket. And it comes with 96 sticks, my guy. And I'm telling you right now, I have had many people purchase the meat bucket or some of their other variety packs, and I have not had one complaint. They're not acidic. They're not a bunch of process. Uh, 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 tastings, taste process, tastings. Let me say it this way. I have never liked the beef sticks from other companies, but as soon as I actually tried a Pearson ranch beef stick, I bought it from tractor supply. I was like, this stuff is some good meat. I use it when I go hunting. 
something that I can keep in my pocket. I have a bucket of it in my truck. If I'm on the job and I can't make it to lunch, as we all know that happens, I can grab myself a couple beef sticks and chomp on those. And it, it carries me to the, to the next time I'm hungry, which may be, maybe, you know, dinner. Um, Pearson Ranch Jerky. Definitely check them out. If you go to the link in my bio, thejohndawson.com and click on the Pearson Ranch logo, you can check out the meat bucket or the variety pack. And I promise you, I promise you, you're going to absolutely love them. My favorite is the buffalo or the elk or, or the venison. I, you know what? I would say buffalo or elk is my top favorite. Venison is really good. They're all delicious. You can't go wrong. If you buy something from them, shoot me a message. I promise you it's going to be like, oh my God, John, it's so good. Check it out at thejohndawson.com. Click on the Pearson Ranch logo and it'll take you right to their website to check out some of their good good and there are some discount codes and those will show up there for you as well pearson ranch jerky we appreciate you guys support um i was told that the investment was going to come in um like the day after thanksgiving and so i figured out a way to i bought a cargo trailer because i couldn't afford um a moving trailer um and I bought a cargo trailer because I knew I could resell it or I could use it for my business. So I bought a cargo trailer, loaded up, and we got a sublease. Uh, a, an amazing couple was moving out of their apartment in Waco, Texas. Um, and um, just everything aligned. And this was about three days before. We were, we were already packed up and moving. We didn't have a place to live. We were already packed up and moving to Texas. Um, I think we were leaving in three or four days. And I saw something on Craigslist. And it was someone who has a sublease. They're trying to get out of it. Um, they didn't require our credit, uh, which I didn't have because I didn't have a job at the time. So I didn't have anything to show for that. And they said, as long as you can pay X amount of the rent, um, you can you can sublease this. So we did that. We drove straight to Texas with a cargo trailer and a baby. Um, and we moved into this apartment. And as soon as we got to that apartment, I started looking for a house to buy. Um, I just started driving around Waco, driving around. The reason we chose Waco is because the real estate market was good at the moment. Uh, it's a university city, which means no matter what happens, your exit strategy can always be renting to students. So your investment is very safe. It's really easy to get, uh, uh money loaned to you in, in a situation like that. We had Magnolia booming at the time. We had uh, Baylor university, which was great. Um, and then the entry level of homes, we're looking at, you know, 40, 50, 60, $80,000 to buy a home. Um, so it was just a really good market, which is why we chose it. And so um, drove around for probably two weeks until I found a house. I found it. Um, I I got it under contract. I called a I called a hard money lender and I said, "Hey, I need X amount of money to buy this house. This is the rehab budget. This is the the um, this is the um, resale value once it's all remodeled. Um, and this is the location. This is blah blah blah. And they funded it. They funded it. They they said." All right, let's go. So basically the way that works is they don't give you all the money up front. Um, at closing, they pay for the home um, and then they give you draws. So at closing, we closed and then I had to get the demo done before they would actually send me any cash to actually remodel. So I went in there um, with a few tools that I had from the remodel in Kansas and I gutted the entire home. Top to bottom, sheetrock, uh, shiplap, um, insulation, everything was old. It was a 1920 home. And then I got my first draw. I think my first draw was around $15,000. And then I just went crazy on it. And I spent every waking minute in that house working on it. And long story long, um, eventually got it done, uh, was going to sell it, but ended up doing more of a refinance and turned it into an Airbnb. So that refinance actually kicked me out another, uh, what was it? I want to say it was another $92,000. So I got $92,000 out of that. I had the loan paid off, right? I think the loan was around a hundred thousand. No, 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 no. 120,000. And then I sold it for, I think two ten or something like that. My numbers might not be right, but it's something around there. I think I walked away with around 90 something thousand dollars. Um, and, uh, it was an Airbnb. So it was a performing asset, which is why I got a little bit more for it. Uh, than, than what it would normally have sold if it was just a house, an empty house. So it was technically a performing asset, which is always a good way to sell your, your investments if you can. Um, and then that money went straight into buying my ranch in Crawford, 
Well, first off, there was another house that I did during that. There was a 17th street house that I was doing during that. Um, but then the chunk of money that came from, um, the first house that I flipped in Texas went to buying the ranch, which was a two house, uh, combo, two homes on, on one three acre little ranch. Um, and, uh, that's kind of how it all started. I mean, there's, there's a lot more to that, but that's kind of how it started. You can kind of see how it went from nothing and being like, what do I do to now I have my life in my hands right now that money sounds big and all like, Oh, $90,000 in a lump sum or $80,000 in a lump sum. But when that goes right back into the next thing, you're not living on much. Like when I'm getting $15,000 draw, like my time is being spent remodeling a house. I don't have a job, but I I can't take that $15,000 and, and go buy, you know, um, you know, stuff for myself with it because it needs to get the job done. So during that time, we're living off of pennies, like pennies, like beans, rice, right? Um, you know, anything that you can find that's insanely cheap, like that's what you're getting because my full-time job is not paid. I only get paid when all that money comes in at the end. So it was very difficult to figure that out. But in the end, like I said, at the very beginning of this podcast, I'd rather be poor on my terms than rich on yours. So we were doing what we wanted to do. We were, we were restoring a 1920s home. We were putting antiques in it. We were doing DIYs because we couldn't afford certain things. So we had to make it ourselves. Um, and that house still to this day is one of the nicest houses in that area um, on, 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 that, on that side of town. And um, it, it's just, it's one of these things where if you don't like the way your life looks, you've got to do something about it. And, and sometimes it requires you to move to a different state with no plan of anything. And just knowing deep down that you believe in yourself. This is why I think it's so important to teach kids to believe in themselves. Like if you're scared, like I don't want to quit my job because my dream isn't for sure. And I'm like, okay, then your dream will never happen. Now I'm not saying go out and do something stupid. I'm not saying put yourself in a financial burden. I'm saying sometimes, and we were young enough to do it, But sometimes you have to say, this isn't working. This is actually taking me back. So I can either stick my head out on a limb and see what happens. And and we were blessed. We were were very blessed. And and I will say this because I'm not going to, I'm not taking credit for just being this badass dude. That's not the case. Um, I was very blessed to have my family um, always ready to fall back on. If I moved, if I moved to Texas and everything failed, worst case scenario, I ended up back at my parents' house and I had to start again. Right. So that's 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 a huge safety net that I had. Because the worst thing that could happen is me ending up right back where I was. And that's not very bad because I could either stay where I was and you know, it's a bummer nothing happens and I live life in mediocrity or I can go out there and bust my ass and believe in myself that I can make something happen. And if it doesn't happen, worst case scenario, I'm right back where I was going to be the whole time anyway. So I did it and, um, the rest is history. Now, now I'm here. Um, I'm sitting on acreage. I have two homes on this property. Uh, you know, dogs, kids, deer, um, you know, I, I, I wake up and I kind of do what I want to do, what, what I think is going to further my life and, and, and put us in a better position tomorrow than we are today. That's what I get to do every day. I'm still not eating freaking, you know, gourmet steaks at restaurants every night. I'm still not going on vacations to Vegas and Hawaii and all these other things every single year. Like it's still bare minimum, but it's, it's my bare minimum. I don't owe a credit card company, right? I don't owe a mortgage company. I don't owe a, a car note. I don't owe, you know, any of these things, right? My bills are electricity and and my phone, right? So it's like, we need to instill in our kids that one, it's not bad to be at the bottom. It's not bad to be at the bottom. Don't be scared of being at the bottom. Just don't be content at being at the bottom, right? I'm not scared to be at the bottom because I know I'll never stay there because I'm always going to try. Now, if I try and I get up two rungs on the ladder and I fall back down, I'm still not scared of being at the bottom, but I'm very uncomfortable being at the bottom. And there's a difference between being scared of being at the bottom and being comfortable at being at the bottom. If you're comfortable at being at the bottom, then you're going to stay there. You're going to live there. You're going to blame everybody else for all your problems. You're going to blame Walmart for not paying you enough. You're going to blame minimum wage for not being higher. You're going to blame, you know, the government for not liking you because you're black or you're a girl or you're 
gay or whatever. You're going to blame everybody else. If, you, if you're comfortable at being at the bottom, you're going to blame everyone else that they're the ones that did that to you. And, and then you're going to just be comfortable in that. It's not my fault. I'm here. Or you can be okay with being at the bottom, but be very uncomfortable there. Right? Like I always say, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's something that I want to instill into people as, as, as my life goes on, as the years go on, as my, as my daughters grow up, I'm fine with you failing. I'm fine with you falling flat on your face. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is when you're laying in the dirt and you're like, it's not that bad here. That's when I get scared. That's when I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, (laughs) no, no. I'm not mad you're in the dirt. I'm mad that you're happy being in the dirt. Too many kids are just like, well, this is where I'm going to be because the system won't let me. And I'm like, "Mm -mm. Mm -mm. mm-mm, mm-mm. If someone that's ever looked like you has done anything ever in their life, there's no reason you can't. A lot of people look at successful people and say, oh man, that's so crazy that they can do that. I look at them and say, there's no way I couldn't do that. If this bag of bones is making this amount of money and living this dream, I know I can do it because I promise you my perspective and my, my, my drive and my resiliency is way better than that guy's. So looking at life through a different perspective is like huge, huge. Um, and I think more people need to see that. And that was a long way. That was a very long story to kind of say, it's cool not knowing. It's it's totally fine not knowing where you're going, where you're going to be, but it's not cool to just sit back and take it, right? No one, no one, no one should be bent over a barrel willingly, okay? We all get bent over a barrel at some point, right? but it's a matter of making sure that you just still fight to get up and keep going. Um, and I don't want this podcast to be a bunch of motivation and all this other stuff, but, um, that, that's, that's, I guess, I don't know where I started on this. This is the hard part about talking to myself. Um, I, that's, that's why I think that's why I left California. That's why I kept moving. I kept moving. I kept moving. When I failed, I kept moving. I kept moving. I kept moving. And no, it wasn't easy. No, it wasn't comfortable. Yes. There was tons of arguments, tons of fights, tons of tears, tons of just what the F am I doing, man? Um, and I was going through my pictures the other day and there was a lot of pictures that I had, um, in my phone from video screenshots of moments that I screenshotted because I I knew that that was a moment where I just wanted to quit. There was times I was sitting on this house that I just built on the roof, just being like, I'm done. I'm exhausted. When, when you're your own person, things don't get done unless you do it. When I was building that house, if I'm not there building the house, the house isn't getting built. It's not like there's a subcontractor getting stuff done while I'm sitting at home. It's not like, you know, X, Y, and Z is getting taken care of while I'm, you know, doing another thing. If I'm not doing it, it's not getting done. And there's tons of times where I was just like, I want to quit. Like I would just look at the house. I'm like, I got, I got a billion things I've got to do. Every single plank of flooring I need to put in, every single stud I need to frame up, every single, you know, pillar, um, um, uh, you know, electrical outlet, everything needs to be done. And I'm the only one that's going to do it. Um, and you just keep moving and it's shocking. And I, and I have the track record now to show it and I can look back and I understand it now. If you just keep moving, it's crazy what happens. Crazy what happens. All right. That, that was a lot of, of just storytelling. Um, I don't know how many of y'all I lost during that, but, um, it's a crazy life, man. It's a crazy life. Again, I'm, I'm so blessed and so happy to be on my terms in life. I love being able to wake up and I don't get a phone call from some guy. Hey, can you come into work? Um, I love waking up and not having, you know, um, you know, my car note being due. I love waking up, not having my, you know, uh, you know, a water bill or, or having a, you know, anything like that. Like when I wake up, I kind of, it's not glamorous, but I know what it is. I, I know what I own and what I'm in control of. And it's pretty sweet. It's a pretty freeing feeling if I'm being honest. But, um, you know, it is what it is, guys. And uh, a lot of you guys, so I, I went live the other day. I was switching topics here. And um, people were asking me why I, why I wear a cowboy hat. I had a lot of black people that were pissed off. Like, what's a goofy hat, bro? And I was like, man, I, I'm, I think I'm a cowboy. You know, I got my horse, Theo. I didn't tell you guys that. Uh, we bought a horse. His name's Theo. And, uh, he's not on our ranch yet. He's, he's at a friend's house, uh, because he's still a little green. The guy who had him before didn't put the best training on him. Uh, he's only five years old, but he's a, he's a good boy, man. He's a, he's a good dude. He's a solid, he's a solid equine. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's a great dude, man. Um, hopefully going to go 
I don't know if it's dry enough outside, but I'd like to go ride him today. But um, he's a good dude. And um, I grew up riding horses. So I grew up, my parents had horses. We didn't have nothing fancy, but we had four four horses, five horses. And um, I grew grew up riding bareback. We had a horse named Little Black. <laughs> I kid you not, Little Black it was a tiny little black pony. I think it was a Shetland pony, I think. And um, I would I would put a little bareback saddle pad on him, and we would just go ride around, man. Uh, we had um, uh, a big mountain behind us that was like a, a, I don't think we were supposed to be on there, but it was a reserve. It was like a, a, some, a California reserve park something. And um, I would just, we would just take off and we would ride. We had Naomi, we had Little Black, and we had, uh, what was the other one? Bree. And uh, yeah, so I grew up riding horses and then my wife rides. She's ridden her whole life. She's, she's a trainer. She's... Um, probably the best person I've ever seen handle horses in my entire life. Uh, just the most knowledge you'll ever get about horses, period. Um, and uh, I grew up, you know, watching Roy Rogers, Have Gun, Will Travel, uh, you know, Bonanza. Like, I grew up cowboy, you know, not necessarily out there ranching, but I grew up just watching that lifestyle and loving it. And um, now that I live on on land and I have, you know, you know, we're getting ready to build some some turnouts and some pastures. And uh, uh, we've got a little arena that I just recently built and we're going to be building another arena. Um, the cowboy life is just I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily a cowboy life, meaning I rope steers. I think it's more of, you know, the more actually, you know what? Hold up. I got a video that I wanted to show you all. Let me see if I can pull this up. Um that I thought was actually pretty cool. Um, it's not, it's, it's kind of relevant, but I thought it was, I thought it was really cool. Let me, let me, let me play this for you guys real quick. Let's see if I can get this up on the, on the screen. Horse is a true reason why we are all here today. The horse gave birth to the cowboy. The horse helped write history. And what I learned across the Americas at three miles an hour and 20 miles a day, is that the horse is a common language that brings people together. Every day I needed to knock on a stranger's door and ask for help. No one ever denied me help. And out of all the doors that were open along the way, whether it was by a politician, a rancher, or sometimes a drug lord, those doors were open thanks to my beautiful horses. I discovered that the charro, the vaquero, the gaucho, o peão, o cowboy, we may dress differently. We may use different tools. We may even ride different breeds of horses, but we all share the same values and beliefs. We wake up early and sleep late to put food on people's tables. We are stewards of the land. We live for our animals. We speak the same language. I thought, I thought that was pretty cool. Now, now, in no way am I like that kind of cowboy. I'm not riding across the country on a horse. But, but when you and I feel like the mo, anybody who makes fun of cowboy culture, anybody who doesn't like the Western world, um, there's one issue with them. They've just never experienced it. I genuinely believe that anyone that doesn't like cowboy culture, Western culture, um, country culture, if you will, has just not experienced it, um, because. For me, it's like it, it's that lifestyle that I've always chased, which is it's the moral values. It's the the treatment of people, of animals, of others in general um, and just the historical importance of it. Like when you actually break it down, like you think about the United States, I mean, it was it was built off of a horse's back. You know what I mean? Uh, the travel, the wagons, the 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 progress, the the construction, the farming, the you know all of that was done with horses, right? Um, and mules and other things. But along that same line, it's like I live in the cowboy capital of the world, um, and it, you know to to call us to to call out the obvious and and what and what we're looking at. Um, I'm a black dude in, in a predominantly white area, but also culture. And I have not once been disrespected here in, in my town by, by anybody, be it a 75 year old geezer with a cowboy hat and a, and a scarf, um, 
or a dust rag or whatever they call them. Um, what I've realized is that in cowboy culture and in country lifestyle, if you give respect nine times out of 10, if not 9.9 .9 times out of 10, you get the respect. If you disrespect, then you're going to probably face some problems. But when I go around this town, when I go around, you know, whether it be um, rodeo, whether it be uh, just a, a, a parade downtown for 4th of July or for Christmas, there's, there's nothing but respect given unless you're, you're hit with something else. And people look out for their own, whether it be the, the, the private school that my daughter goes to, um, everyone is there to raise children to be good people, good humans. They're there to teach people and, and kids the importance of respect for your elders, respect for your authority, uh, respect for animals, respect for hard work, respect for dedication. Uh, you, you, you can't have a horse, you can't have animals if you aren't consistent. Um, you can't take care of things if you don't own that responsibility as your own. And I feel like so many people are raised with this me mentality nowadays, especially when you get into a lot of these big cities where it's like, I need to look out for me before I look out for anyone else in the sense of like cutthroat, I guess. And I, I feel like cowboy culture, country culture really harps on the fact that you take care of your own, you take care of your family, you take care of your livestock, you take care of your neighbors, you take care of people that are in your vicinity before you start going to take care of people you've never met in Ukraine. You know what I mean? It's, it's important that, that the kids that you have and the kids that your kids hang out with are taken care of. It's looking out for, for everyone's best interests um, in your immediate vicinity. And I think that's why the cowboy culture, and I, and I think there's something about having the horse and having the ranch that just kind of ties it all in. It just shows you how much you as an individual can create um, and do and accomplish by just being consistent, by going out and feeding your animals, um, taking care of your dogs, taking care of your horses, taking care of your cattle, taking care of your tack, taking care of your vehicles, taking care of your land, like taking care of your neighbors, you know, having like this, this house that I'm in right now is a guest house. It's a, it's a tiny home, but it's here. If someone needs to be taken care of, if someone comes up on hard times, like I have the ability to reach out and say, Hey, do you need a place to sleep a couple nights? Uh, my brother is currently living on my property right now because he's in between things right now. And I'm, I'm helping him get on his feet in, in the, in the direction that he wants to go because he finally made that decision to, to live broke on his terms versus live rich on someone else's. Now that doesn't mean he's living broke forever. It means he's finally putting his effort, his energy, his mental capacity into his life, not, you know, someone else's or whoever else he worked for. Um, and he's in a much better place. He's making less money. He's making a lot of less money, like a lot of less money. He's making a lot less, but his head is in the right space. He enjoys getting up every day and doing things on his terms. Um, he's building something that he is excited about and he wants to see come to fruition and turn into something. And I think that's what this is about. And that's what I want this podcast to be about is people diving into what they need out of life, not what your boss needs out of life, not what your parents need out of life, what you need out of life. And then once you chase what you need out of life, you'd be shocked at how many other lives you can help once you finally put your affairs in order. And I feel that way about America why go out and help another household when yours is burning down? If you're getting a divorce and getting foreclosed on, don't give marriage and home advice to people, right? And and I think our world needs to hear that a lot is you can't, you can't let everyone in when you can't take care of the people that are already here, right? You, you can't go out there and solve other people's affairs when your affairs are completely run to shit. That's it. Go out there and cheat for yourself. You know what I mean? Anyway, guys, that's the podcast. I would appreciate you guys sharing this with anyone who you might think would like it. Subscribing to the podcast, leaving a comment down below on Apple iTunes. You can scroll down and leave a review, leave a five star, leave a one star if you hate it, whatever it is. I appreciate you guys so much. Again, you can watch this full episode on YouTube if you'd like. And um, that's all I got for today. And I'll see you guys on the next podcast. I appreciate y'all much love.